Hey, yo, it's us, Corinne and Sabrina. And today we are accompanied by and haunted with some of our new favorite friends from Petty Crimes Podcast. We have Griff and Kira. They join us. We analyze a petty crime with them. We learn about Kira's hauntings in her home. We talk about some of the most horrifying films with Griff and then head on over to their podcast because Sabrina and I joined to talk more about ghosts and to analyze more petty crimes by ghosts. Committed by ghosts. Yeah, will we find them guilty, innocent, both? Or brilliant. Or brilliant. Yeah, the ghosts have given us a lot of ideas, so we'll be sure to execute on some of these crimes ourselves. <laughs> yeah, if anything, watch out more to like our friends and family than anything. Griff and I might be hiding in the woods to scare everyone nowadays. I don't know. We we might be up to no good. Yeah. Well, Kira and I are going to run for the hills. We're going to start. We're going to have to trade podcast hosts <laughs> with each other because you guys. <laughs> the box on the hill. Us. You two can go buy the old haunted house box on the hill. But enjoy. We hope you love this episode as much as we had so much fun recording it. And check out the other episode where we're on Petty Crimes on the Petty Crimes feed. Also comes out today. And then also just check out Petty Crimes. Enjoy. Hi. Oh. Welcome. Hi. Hey. Hello. Thank you for joining us. You two were in my dream last night, believe it or not. I dreamt of you too. <laughs> what? No so way. Joking. Wait. I had, I, it was just a, it was a stress dream about the recording. More of the technical oh. things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> was yours like a romantic dream? Sorry, we're stressing you out. No, we're all no, frolicking. No, no. <laughs> no ours was, mine was fun. Mine was like a very fun one. And then I woke up and I was like, I can't wait. Yeah, it was great. It was a nice, pleasant dream. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And then I woke up and I was like, I have questions for you. Well, we're going to hear your ghost stories and your your connection to the paranormal. And then we want to talk all about petty crimes and hear about the podcast. But I was wondering, would you two consider yourselves petty in nature at all? Or have you been petty before? Yes, <laughs> I, I am petty by nature, but I would say I'm more um, a consumer of pettiness than an active participant in petty culture. Like, I love to see it. I love to perpetuate it. But I'm not really one for, like, petty vengeance myself. Whereas Griff... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Griff... <laughs> so Kiera is an instigator even in this situation right now, too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah she, she doesn't stir anything, clearly. Um, I... I think I think I'm similar. I like taking a step back and watching things that I know will be petty and maybe that I'm correct about that I don't want to really give full energy in correcting someone about unfold. You just watch the world burn. Exactly. It's like that meme of that little girl looking behind her while the house is burning. I am I am that little girl. Mm. So I'll be there to watch. I don't know that I will be there to like fully participate in said pettiness. Except if it's for our show, I guess. <laughs> yeah, except for every single week when you guys <laughs> talk about all the petty crimes. Yeah, yeah. What about you two? I feel like you're more petty than I am. Me? Yeah. Oh, I can hold a grudge for sure. But the grudges I hold are petty. It's like, I will forgive people for the the things that you wouldn't normally forgive someone. Like my grudges are, are super, super petty. The cheesecake. Yes. Oh, when I was 12 years old... I waited for like 90 minutes for a key lime pie to be delivered to my hotel room. And when I was, my dad also ordered a plain cheesecake. It finally arrives. <laughs> this sounds like, this is so petty. And it's also, it's, it's like petty. so bougie. Like yeah. I was in Greece waiting for my key lime pie. It took 90 minutes to arrive. I went to the bathroom while it was <laughs> delivered. I come out, my dad has eaten my key lime pie. And I was so mad at him. I was like, how the fuck do you not know the taste of key lime? I was so mad at him. And so now it's it's been this running joke, but it's not really a joke because I actually feel myself get mad about it every single time I talk about it. <laughs> so like that's the pettiness. But like if someone wrongs me and does something so horrible to me, I'm so much more forgiving. I'm like, I get it. It's a growth period. Like you're forgiven. Move on. But I cannot forgive my dad for eating my key lime pie when I was 12. Yeah. He's probably done nothing for you either. No, he's literally no. Nothing. He's <laughs> not one thing. <laughs> Worst dad award. <laughs> he's literally the opposite. 
I get petty over my food too. Like I know what I want to eat. I know the like amount that I want to eat and not mentioning any specific names. Uh, but some people tend to pick off of people's plates without, you know, consent, I guess. Kira, is that you? Do you do that? I love to share. <laughs> I, I really, I am um, love to sort of live a communal lifestyle. Yeah, Griff is definitely very petty about food. Yesterday we were talking about going to get Korean barbecue. And Griff was like, the thing about Korean barbecue is I get full really fast and I feel like I end up paying for other people's gluttony. <laughs> Literally a direct quote. I can't, I can't and imagine. I was like, you're out of your gourd. That's wild. <laughs> like Korean barbecue is a very fun social dinner hang. And the idea that when Griff is at Korean barbecue, he's in his head going, gluttons. Glutton. I see that I'll be paying for that. So you want to live a very equitable life. Everyone has to have exactly what they paid for, what they deserve. Mm -hmm. You're not paying yeah. for someone else's food. There is something weird about food. I get it. I didn't think I was like very protective and like selfish when it came to food. But the other day I had a beer in front of me and a friend went to reach and I thought they were reaching for my beer and I freaked out, like reactive, just grabbed my beer and was like, no. And they were grabbing napkins. They were oh. grabbing napkins <laughs> that were next to the beer. And he, he was like, I feel like something very strange just came out of you. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't know. There's a little petty in all of us. There really is. Yeah. Okay, what about ghosts? Are there a little bit of ghosts in all of us? Oh, God. I wish there was a ghost in me. Yeah, Griff wants to be like... Um, inhabited by a ghost really bad. AKA possessed. Yes. Yeah, I did, I will say a few weeks ago, I had an audition where I had to play a possessed being. Um, and the scene was really intense and I grew up and I still to this day love, love, love possession films. Can you give us a little taste? It was, oh my God, it was so, gr it was written very gruesome and aggressive, but like, just like stares and awkwardness and uncomfortability and you can change your voice a little or like. <laughs> really quick like movements like <laughs> i love a good like deep guttural <gasps> like oh i'm going to possess you that oh kind of stuff i have to find the screech that i did i thought i like what you were doing kind of like fast scary yeah, yeah. like scratchy yeah. fast yeah scratchy fast yeah. i go for <laughs> scratchy fast but no outside of that I, I like grew up in a farmhouse we talked about this before we uh when we first met you two uh, i grew up in a farmhouse in the country you know my grandma has passed away in our house. I think she was happy to move on clearly, but perfect setting for hauntings and spirits to come for me. They just haven't. Um, and to your question earlier, I will say, I think I have strong spiritual energy. So I don't mm -hmm. know if that keeps them at bay or not, but I can talk a little more about that later. You might want it too bad. <laughs> Classic. You're, you're a little too thirsty. It's and you know, that's funny. Yeah. And he, him and boyfriends. Yeah. <laughs> he just wants it too bad. <laughs> Weirdly, they're not possessing yeah. <laughs> He just wants, he just wants a ghost inside of him. Come just on. Like, well, that's all a boy wants. <laughs> what about you, Kira? Do you feel, have you been possessed? I have respect, reverence, and fear for the paranormal. Mm. I don't mess around. I have strong belief. I keep it at a distance. And I have a very good personal ghost story. Okay, wait, let's hear it. Yeah. Is it time? Yes. Straight to the ghost stories. I want to know. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. Mind. Because just like I can be petty sometimes, I'm also extremely impatient. So <laughs> if you say you have a ghost story, you need to tell me immediately because I'm not going to be able to focus otherwise. Okay, yay. This ghost story is courtesy of my mother, Beth. And it takes place in my childhood home in upstate New York. Small town in the Finger Lakes region, the pinky of the Finger Lakes. No, I don't know if you guys have had any Finger Lakes um, <laughs> ghost stories before. And are you familiar with pinkies? <laughs> we, I mean, yeah, yeah. We know a phalange or two. Okay. Great. That understanding won't be critical to okay. the understanding of this crime. So whether or not you are familiar with pinkies, you'll still understand what's about to happen. Okay. So my parents buy a house in upstate New York. We're very excited about it. I am four. I'm not really part of this story. And my, my, <laughs> sorry. my parents buy this house. They're very excited about it. It's a real fixer upper. Everybody calls it the box on the hill because it's uh, boxy and it's on a hill. <laughs> so just a, a classic colonial in upstate New York. Exactly. Oh. Great. Exactly. Okay, Corinne. Corinne knows her architecture. Guys, I'm from 
the Northeast too. My parents buy the house. They close on the house. They are very excited. They head to the house. It's not furnished yet. They literally just closed on it. They're in the kitchen. They open a bottle of champagne. They're very excited. My family friends, the Phillipses, are there. It's actually a minister and a minister's wife. That's not really core to the story, but I do think it's interesting. It is. It's always it's always the religious families bringing this shit in. I, I agree. Think, right? <laughs> Churches are some of the most haunted places. Cemeteries are some of the least haunted places in our experience. Oh, wow. Mm, food for thought. Food for thought. So your parents were already asking for something to happen by having these people in their home. Wow. Okay. Well, shout out to the priests out there. Yeah. Shout, <laughs> shout out to all religions. <laughs> shout out religion. <laughs> we love you, religion. <laughs> so my mom is walking around the house, glass of champagne. She's talking to Mrs. Phillips and she's, she's in like the front of the house. It's big. It's empty. It's like big 12 foot ceilings, broad, open. I don't know. The house was built in like 1810. And my mom says to Mrs. Phillips, I wonder what it was like here in the olden days. And my mom's brother, my uncle Tad, was standing in the front room as well. They're like in the front, like double parlor of the house. If Can we picture that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm there. Good. I wonder what it was like in the olden days. And then my mom turns and behind my uncle Tad, a solid figure walks by. And it is a woman in... Victorian morning garb, like oh. M O U R N I N G. Yeah. She's wearing a bonnet and she is really short, like shorter than my uncle Tad, but she is a solid figure. Yikes. This is giving me like Hill House, Bly Manor, yeah. mm -hmm. Beetlejuice, like creepy house vibes. How you describe where this happened in the house? From my very limited knowledge about how homes were used, it was usually a front room that was kind of like off to the side or one of these like little entry parlors that were used for the showing and grieving of the deceased. <gasps> and also where babies oh. were usually birthed. There were like little birthing nooks and death nooks. And so I wonder if, if this was a kind of like residual haunting where someone was kind of moving into that room and just was constantly stuck in that time period of grieving someone that they lost. But it suggests that there were a few people that maybe were either lost their lives or were dead on the scene in this house. <laughs> <laughs> dead upon purchase. It was like specifically in the bay window of like the front parlor. Yeah. Hmm. I'm suspicious of this. So did anyone encounter this woman again while living there? Or was this just like a first glance, her just announcing herself that she did exist there? So there weren't future visits, but my mom delved into the past and learned about oh. past visits. Oh. <gasps> yes. So like the, the falling out of this incident, my mom like freaks out, sets the champagne down, walks out of the house. She's like so phased by this. And for the next three weeks, sleeping with the lights on, kids in the bed. My mom told me she was reading the Bible, which like, we're not religious. Like we, we, we're not <laughs> like, we're friends with the Phillipses, but like we're not, we're not religious. My mom's like, for three weeks, I was, I was reading the Bible. And my mom's parents were, well, they were in England at the time. But when, when my Grammy came back, she's, cause my mom was like, I just wanted my mom. My grandmother was like, that's, it's nothing. Da, 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 da. My mom starts contacting the people that lived in the house before. And the previous owners said house wasn't haunted. No, not at all. The people before that, my mom called and the woman goes, oh, yes. Yeah, the house is haunted. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. And it, a woman confirmed that it was. Mm -hmm. okay. What did they experience? She said it was an angelic presence. She said, it's not a bad thing. Oh. They just let you know that they're there, but it, it feels good. It's a good, it's a good warm feeling, but it's nothing bad. Well, that's good. That's positive. Especially because Best case scenario. the appearance of kind of like being in that all black, it is very like insidious, you know, like the, mm -hmm. the bonnet, the black, they're like wandering through. There's something ominous about it, but okay. So I'm a little bit suspicious that the family that your mom first called, the one that you're your parents purchased the house from part of me thinks that they're lying and i wonder if they truly didn't experience something 
or if they were in denial, or if they were nervous that your parents were going to try to like sue them or something for not disclosing a haunting (laughs) before selling the house to them. So they were like, no, there's definitely nothing there. (laughs) No give backs. No give backs. Well, (laughs) I'm out, I'm free. It's funny you say that because we, my older siblings and I, obviously we started going to school in this town and everybody at school told us that our house was haunted. (laughs) <laughs> you're like the house at the end of the hill sort of vibe or like house at the end of the street i mean your house literally had the nickname too of what was it like the b- box house on the hill box, box on, on the, the hill. hill yeah box on the hill house <laughs> yeah and Ooh. new season coming out and like my brother my brother's classmates were like everybody knows about your house like there are nuns buried in the basement of your house <laughs> <laughs> those weren't in the details yeah, and well, it turns out there weren't nuns buried in the basement, but it was it was one of those things where like you, kids hear something crazy at school and it's not quite right, but it is there is a kernel of truth and the kernel was the nuns lived next door. Oh. And for many years cuz we were kitty corner to a church. Griff's making a face. Yeah. Yeah. Of if we had the church is little red flags, it, this would be a moment that we raised them. <laughs> Red flag. Yeah. Red flag church. Red flag church. Yep. Um, and so the the nuns lived in the house next door. They probably weren't buried in the basement, but they did live right next door. Yeah. So everyone said the house was haunted. And they were right. And they were right. And my sister went to a house party. The teenage son of the family that lived there before us, oh. he goes, yeah, the house is haunted. <gasps> okay. Here we go. Yes. And he insinuated that it was part of the reason they moved. I knew it! I knew it. (laughs) There's something too suspicious about how quick they were to say, this place is not haunted. Mm -hmm. Oh. Wow. Corinne and Sabrina, in your your expertise with the show and this subject matter, because actually the the case that I'm going to present to you on our show's episode involves women in a kind of generational way. In your experience, do spirits show themselves more to women than men? Or vice versa, or is it equitable, do you think? It's hard to say because I think we hear more experiences being told by women. But in my experience, men, not to stereotype all men, but I think that they have probably just as many experiences, but are less likely to admit it or to bring it up in conversation. Mm. To share emotion. (laughs) To be vulnerable and potentially be viewed as weird. Our listenership, I mean, more women listen to podcasts too. So I feel like we are just submitted. We have more stories submitted by women. And then there is, you know, I really do believe there is something to like the power that women possess and our hormones and our menstruation and like how that is connected to the universe and like the planetary system that, I mean, women are just magical. Yeah. I totally agree. (laughs) But I mean, the conjuring house is a good, a good uh, example of this where basically like everything that happened at the conjuring house the suspicion was, and, and Griff, maybe you remember this from the first movie, was that basically because there were all of these pubescent and teenage girls who were all menstruating and hormones and emotion and drama and rage, it basically just somewhat like activated, yeah, activated <laughs> these hauntings. Yeah. It's weird to blame women's periods for paranormal activity, but maybe there <laughs> is something to it. I don't know. I won't rule it out. Yeah. Kira, your story also kind of reminds me of The Conjuring House because <laughs> only only a very brief part of it, nothing else. Surprise, she's but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they told us that the day that they moved in, so similar to like how your story began, the girls were bringing in boxes into the home and there was a man standing in the doorway that they had to like fully move around and they thought it was just like a previous owner or a neighbor and he like looked at them, they interacted with him. He was not real, like not human. Mm. Wow. But that solid full figure that you say, it is so interesting, yeah. And during a transitional time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the energy of the space is changing. Totally. I also imagine the spirits who live in this home and have lived with this family for a really long time are very curious, like who, who's moving in now? Who are these new people? Am I gonna like them? So this boy from the previous family, did he give any details about what specifically happened that kind of triggered them? Because I feel like there would have to be something kind of serious with the haunting, aside from just occasionally. Maybe I'm maybe I'm presuming this 
but I feel like for me to be like, this house is so haunted, I have to leave. It would be more than a figure just moving during the daylight into a room. Yeah, this is where the account gets a little unreliable because it was this conversation with my sister was they were 16 years old and they were both at a part a house party. They might have been teenagers drinking. No, they would never. 16 year olds at a house party? They were reading the Bible. <laughs> exactly. Yes, like we've made one thing clear. This town is incredibly biblical. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, but what my sister texted, her report is He's like, mom and dad, why did we have to move out of our beautiful house in the village that is close to everything and move out like to like a really rural house? Why does he talk like he's from like the 1920s? <laughs> well, we know why. The spirit. The spirit has possessed him. Possessed him. Uh, mm -hmm. um, also, because my sister is just, she's old timey by nature. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And his parents say, oh, that old dump was haunted. And <laughs> And then my sister writes, LOL. So we don't really get any detail. Um, <laughs> okay. That's all you need. That's all you need. That old place, it was haunted. Oh, that old dump was haunted. Yeah, so there's like a really, a big lack of specificity about what the hauntings were in the past, but it's like understood and confirmed by like multiple people. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Did it affect your ability to make friends that you lived on the ha haunted house on the hill? Yes. <laughs> um, I feel like other things impacted my ability to make friends more. Uh <laughs> like what? Let's let's unpack this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I sort of like I, I sort of flew under the radar of all of this because I was four. So it was like my mom didn't she sort of like didn't tell me about it. And she just said that she like after that initial time where she thought like, I wonder what this house was like in the olden days. She just said that she never went there again. She didn't, mm -hmm. she didn't ruminate or imagine about the past and the house. She just didn't let herself go there. But as we continued to live there, she did like feel the presence and it didn't feel bad. It felt good. And when we finally moved away, the like realtor called and asked like, hey, is, is your house haunted? And my mom said, oh yes, yes it is. And she goes, but it's not bad. And the next people bought the house and they were quite happy there. And the house went back on the market a few years later and my family was moving back to this town. And my mom was like, and I would, I would have bought that house again. Wow. I would have lived there again. Cause okay. yeah, okay. it wasn't, it was haunted, but it was like, it wasn't bad and it wasn't scary. And I, I would have lived there. Hmm. That's like an ideal haunting. I feel like most people, <laughs> I would, I would love to buy a house that's haunted like that because then you know what you're going, you you know what you're getting. It is coexisting. They're not continuously like interfering in your life or making life miserable. They're not <laughs> possessing you. And what a cool story. I know. I feel like houses like that too, you know how so many of the older houses, they have plaques on them that say they like built in 1811 or or whatever. Mm -hmm. I feel like, like Captain, yeah, Captain yeah. Phillips Andrew who sailed the seas and- A seaman. Yes, a seaman, a baker. I feel like underneath that, all of these old houses should have a star rating. You know how like a hotel will have a five star, three star. We should have little ghosts and it up to five ghosts. Ghost rating. It has a rating of how haunted yeah. this old place is. I pick up. Yeah, that's my pitch. We have a rating system on our podcast and it's one to five teacups and it's for um, how risque the episode oh. is. Ooh. So I would be I would be very pro uh, ghost rating on homes. Yeah. Okay. It's good okay. to know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. We should do that for our show. Ghost ratings ghost for how, how spooky. One to five. Yeah. You two have you two have visited some haunted spaces, right? The Conjuring House specific. I saw that on your website. Yeah. And I like, lost my shit. That I love that world. So we we have for years been talking about haunted places. We grew up in haunted homes. We were creepy kids. Like <laughs> that's just like who we are. But we have never done a paranormal investigation until the Conjuring House. Like we just went full in. We we're like, let's go to the scariest place possible instead of dip our toes into paranormal investigation. Like full head first dive in, and it wasn't terrifying. Surprisingly, I think what a lot of other people experienced and some of the things, it was odd. It was like what we felt we walked away with was the knowledge that you kind of get from the spirits what you bring in. So if you go in with a lot of empathy and understanding and kindness and openness, that you'll probably have a much better experience where I think a lot of the people who go to haunted places like the Conjuring House are probably 
really scared to begin with or really determined to capture some paranormal activity so much so that they like have this kind of testing come at me bro energy which probably probably triggers some of the more negative spirits to come out of the woodworks or just spirits to respond more aggressively so we certainly got a lot of paranormal activity but none of us none of us left neither of us left feeling really scared of the place like we would absolutely go back yeah wow take me with you we will griff come let's do it the next time you fly out to your your old farmhouse let's Take a trip down south to the Conjuring House. Let's I feel like it. too, like on top of that, I I believe I, I like I said at the top, don't have any personal anecdotes of that nature. But I do, and to play devil's advocate, like the human mind is very powerful. And so, to your point, Corinne, like if you're going into spaces, really any space uh, that has energy with expectations, your mind starts to see things through that lens that you're going in with. And so, mm. while I fully believe in stories and um the the existence of these energies and spirits uh i think probably more often than not people are like psyching themselves out and, ex and expecting to see something and manifesting it that way because as powerful as like this interim like uh presence or kind of land is the human mind on earth is also very powerful so i totally hear that point 100 percent. okay so i'm curious griff since you're you're sort of a horror movie enthusiast. What is your like top three scary movies? Yeah, top three scary movies. I'd say when I was a kid, I watched The Others so, so mm -hmm. much. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's Such as like, it's not a jump. I mean, it has jump scares in it, but it's not like like insidious, like, like oh, shit yeah. your pants horror. No, <laughs> it's no, very no, subtle. No, and, no, no. <laughs> oh my God, Corinne. <laughs> She's so bad at it. I know. Too creepy. <laughs> So I don't like that. We, uh, Actually, that's all the time we have today. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> um, no, the others for sure, like just because of how early I started watching it. I also fell in love with like performance from that. Nicole Kidman's nuts in it in a good yeah, way, obviously. So good. Um, yeah. And then the one that like fully scared me and kind of got me addicted to specifically going to the movie theater and having that like uh, intense shared communal experience of horror is The Exorcism of Emily Rose. So I put that in my top three. That one I had, it took me two times at the movie theater to actually get through it because I had to leave in the middle of it. I was so terrified. That's a great yeah, one. I, I agree with you on that. Loved it. And again, like farm girl who grew up religious, like I, I grew up not like super religious, but it was part of our like kind of social calendar for a few years. Anything farm related, conjuring specifically, like anything like big white house, it's always a big white house yeah, in the middle or, of nowhere. That's yeah. how I grew up. Exactly. Mm. So those kind of settings uh, really resonate with me. And then honestly, like I'll give a modern one. I just watched twice in the theaters, Talk to Me, and I thought that was super refreshing yes. and, and great. So I'll put that in there as well. All right. I, I know, me that. too. Yes. You told us about Wait, it. Yeah. Sabrina, you live in LA, right? Mm -hmm. We'll have to be horror movie buddies. Like I, I watch everything. I have been trying to find someone to watch horror movies with me because like I so badly want every Sunday to be sun like Sunday spookies and <laughs> go and watch either a current horror movie or like set up a camp. Like I have this attic up here that is massive, but it has so much space. And I'm like, I want to make it like a movie room and just set up like a bunch of bean bags. There's blackout curtains and then like project a mm, horror movie on so the wall. Nice. I love that. I'm, I I co-sign on that. Were you named Sabrina for any which reasons? I wish. No. My mom, I think I had a great aunt from Italy whose name was Sabrina. And then my mom really liked the movie, the old Sabrina movie. Okay. Mm. Got it. Yeah. Got it, got it. But I think the universe gave me this name, implanted the name into my mother's mind because I was meant to be a spooky girl. Spooky little girl. A spooky girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> spooky girl. <laughs> And to, to close that off, too, again, I don't have any stories of that nature. I wish I did. But I had no, I have noticed something since I moved from the farm to go to school in Boston, which is where Kira and I met. And then it's carried with me to L.A. and kind of any big city because there are streetlights in big cities and not in like where I grew up. Oftentimes when I and this sounds crazy, but I pointed it out several times to the same friend so that she could see the trend. My friend Chelsea, oftentimes when I pass under streetlights, like as soon as I pass underneath it, it'll go out. Oh and my then gosh. I've started noticing. This is so a I'll thing. Like, yeah, is it? What? Yes. 
I'm literally Googling it right now because it's like Paris something or whatever. We talked about this early days in our podcast and oh. street light. It's the street light interference phenomenon. Interference. Yeah. <laughs> street light interference. Street light interference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you are touched by the devil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it says, oh, you absorb the light. Based on claims by many people that they involuntarily and usually spontaneously cause street lamps to go out. And we have heard from many people on our podcast that the same thing happens to them. And I feel like this is going to be the beginning of your paranormal experiences, Griff, because if I'm remembering these things correctly, that is sort of how it started and then they realize how open and what like a little energy beacon they are yeah and things start to find you i'm scared about that <laughs> um, you've been asking for it Toots. i have been asking for it this whole podcast i've been saying that um i will say too it's like to to your point about like feminine energy i think there's nothing stronger than like femininity in the world like it's called mother earth for a reason like giving birth is just, it's truly like otherworldly magical. Mm. Um, I call it daddy earth. <laughs> daddy <laughs> earth. <laughs> Finally when it's being bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll talk about your daddy issues on our show. Or when it's... <laughs> um, We've but got I think daddy as, issues over here too. <laughs> as soon as I started living in my queerness, like outwardly, inwardly, just so like, I just feel really powerful and magical from that. I think it gives me a really different perspective on the world. I feel like my energy is different. I think growing up in the country on a farm, like mm. being with animals, being with like trees and nature, I, I just think I, and I'm sure a lot of people you talk to say this, but like, I, I do feel like connected to nature in a very like You're grounded green way. Yeah. You're a green witch. A green witch? Yes. What's that? Yeah. Where you work with like very plants, plants. nature based. Yeah, very nature based. Oh, and a lot of yeah. people will talk to weed. tree. <laughs> there you go. Oh my gosh, wait, this fits so perfectly with the uh, the petty crime I have for you guys to rate on this episode. But yeah, the green witch, there's a lot of you should try this. I'm curious what what would happen to you if you go out and you kind of talk to a tree, talk to the trees, almost like your therapy, like what you would journal say to a tree, hug a tree, because sometimes people hear something back. He does talk to trees. <gasps> Griff! I know that he does. You're a tree See, hugger. You, already are, does this. You, you are connecting and you didn't even realize it. Yeah, I feel like when, to all of those points, I feel like maybe when I'm in the right place, in the right situation, uh, maybe something will happen. I've just always felt that. I just, I think it's been really nice to your point, like Sabrina, like the energy's nice yeah. for now. I don't fuck around with, I don't know. I think I'm just too in tune to that to really like go into a space and be like, I don't believe this demon. Like, fuck you, show yourself. Like, I, I, I respect it too much. And I feel too like raw and like, like an outlet for something to plug in where I'm like, no, 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 this is your space. Like, It's respect. Let me, yeah. Let me hear you. I, let me understand you. Then I'll, then I'll be on my way. I feel like that is the one difference or one of the most important things that Corinne and I have tried to like take as an approach to the paranormal is it's like very over very respectful approach like we don't know much about the paranormal world we're so fascinated by it but we're never going to be like come at me prove your existence like pr show yourself it's very much like hey it's like psychological if i were you know talking to a human it's like understanding that they have their own past their own history like you don't know what they're going through so you just kind of respect yeah. them and like slowly mm -hmm. unravel and learn about them. And we recently learned that you really do have to be careful about what you talk about and how you talk about it because the darker energies, the demons, apparently love to gossip with each other. They don't really <laughs> want you to be talking about them. But Griff, when you just said that word, that's why I was like, I was like, ooh, they're gonna learn that you were talking about them because basically- They're five teacups. They're, yeah, they're five teacups. <laughs> five they teacups will, for Griff's death. Someone is listening and they're gonna be like, oh, B, Griff said your name, Griff is thinking about you. And it will, it will get to the demon and then they'll be like, hmm, hmm. And they'll kind of watch you and see how much involvement you're trying to have. And then potentially you'll become possessed. Yeah, if I'm a, if I'm a worthy vessel. Yeah. I think wow. you're safe. I don't think you'll be possessed by a demon. I feel like you're very Unless protected you and very powerful, especially given that all of the street lights and, and lights around you kind of are affected. There's clearly some big energy force around you. Okay. Kind of paranormally tangentially related. Do you believe in Bigfoot and aliens? There's only one right answer or else I'm going to have a petty grudge against you. <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes and yes for me. Bigfoot, I feel okay. like 
any animal. Like, there's so much of the earth we haven't really explored yet. So it literally could be some mammal beast that has been sighted that we just don't have a like classification for whether it's like how it's depicted. Sim same with aliens, right? Like whether it's how pop culture has depicted them or, you know, the, like how the emoji shows up when you type it in, probably not, but Bigfoot probably, or maybe aliens 100%. I appreciate this that. This universe is way too vast. Kira, what about you? Yes, my fiance Alex would kill me if I didn't say that I believe in aliens because he is, uh, he's a big, he's a passionate conspiracy theorist. And on our road trip out to Los Angeles, he, uh, a big, a big fixture was our visit to Roswell, New Mexico, <gasps> the site of like the 1947 UFO yeah. crash. Mm -hmm. And we went, we went all the way in on that. I. Uh, Bigfoot, I wonder, because animals are so resilient and adaptive. Like, have you ever seen those TikToks of the dog that walks on its hind legs? <laughs> yeah, the one that doesn't have front legs. So it just walks. Exactly. He doesn't have front legs, so he just walks. I feel like, is Bigfoot a bear and his, his arms are broken? Or you like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I That one, I'm more like, what are you? Um, but, <laughs> but aliens, big time, yeah big time. And I'm terrified. I'm the same way with Bigfoot. Like I want to believe in Bigfoot, especially because I feel like as a friend to Corinne who loves Bigfoot, I feel like I owe it to her to believe in Bigfoot. Mm. But I have a hard time fully believing it because there's very little real evidence. Well, Corinne, what what makes you believe? <laughs> It's a passion, I think she's mostly a fiery passion him. deep within. No, Sabrina, don't make this a shape of water situation. I, <laughs> okay, you literally, it's water. a joke. It's a joke. Literally. <laughs> you said it. Okay. They believed you though. It's a joke. We literally have a merch that says Bigfoot is my boyfriend. So it's a joke we've taken very far yeah. to the point where it's real. To the point where it's real. Okay, that but rocks. It, it kind of came from a same similar situation, Griff, that you were joking about in the beginning where it's like, I could not get a boyfriend for the life of me for a long time. So really my only study was was my belief in Bigfoot. And so that's kind of how that, okay. how that adapted. But no, I just like, similar to what Griff, you were saying with just the evolution of species and our understanding of the earth and finding new species and animals. I really do believe that despite humans thinking that they know pretty much everything, I think there's a lot that's undiscovered. There's a lot that we think we know now that's going to be rewritten and re-understood in a totally different way in the next 50 years. And I do think that there are some sort of Bigfoot creatures out there. I also have a really close family friend who believes that she encountered a Bigfoot and had a, a visual sighting very, in very close proximity. So I also partially feel like it would be a big F you to, to her for me to be like, well, I don't believe your story that terrified you for years. So I 100% believe in Bigfoot. And you love him. I love him. I love him. I am scared of him though, because he seems so strong and so fast. And so big and so muscular. And so muscular. And so, and so hairy. hairy. <laughs> Lips if that's so your thing. juicy and luscious. Mm, could carry me, could throw me around. Corinne Melly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Corinne, do you, do you have a boyfriend currently? I have a husband. She's married. And Sabrina, on <gasps> our wedding weekend, he, Sabrina gave him boxers that said Sasquatch. So she's trying to turn him into Bigfoot for me. He's what so far friend. from Bigfoot. Yeah, he's oh really? He's like a he's like a smooth little dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> not much hair, not much belief in the paranormal, or really he believes, I think, but he's really scared, so he doesn't want to hear about it. So my only outlet to yeah. talk yeah. about Bigfoot is the podcast, because he won't hear about it. So Yeah. Yeah. Should we read the one petty crime that you have, Corinne, for on this episode? We'll see how many teacups you give it, what your analysis is of it. You'll do yours, Sabrina, on our episode? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds like a plan, Stan. Great. Wait, before we close the loop on the ghost story I told, I got a live correction from my sister, which <gasps> Ooh, was... Okay, oh. we love this. The teenager at the party that she talked to was not the former occupant, but the former, former occupant. Oh, Okay. So the kid of the people who told your mom, yes, that place was haunted. 
Exactly. Got it. So that the people in the middle remain a question mark. And I felt like I had to give that correction once you said that the ghosts and the demons like to gossip because <laughs> I was like, well, they're going to say that they're I gonna come am, for you. that they're going yeah, to come for me because I'm story properly. Exactly. I'm propelling misinformation. Um. So yeah. Now we can move on with reverence and also the paranormal world thanks you. Yes. Okay. And I thank them and I respect them and uh, um, please don't <laughs> touch me. <laughs> Do not come towards me. Do not approach me. You know Do what not movie come towards me. I'm really effed me up. Griff, have you seen or Kira, have you seen this too? Have you seen It Follows? Mm -hmm. Yes, a few times. Love. So good. That movie, there is something about something constantly coming for you but at a regular speed that really screwed me up and i've done like i'm horrible at math and i've done deep calculations trying to figure out if that ever happened to me how i would get away with being very far from this creature and be able to comfortably live my life and then when i would have to fly back the other direction yeah. and it screwed me up yep i'd spend my spend my life just going from one side of the world to the other an X amount of time between when it arrived. Yeah, I love that film. I do too. I believe that the most haunting image in that film is when she's driving away from the house and there's a naked old white <sighs> man on the roof on of the, the house. Roof. Yes, that, is, that is the first image mm -hmm. I think of. And every time I'm at the beach, I think of the hair pulling and the, yes. the fight scene. I think of the really tall guy in the door frame. Yeah. That's like him like <laughs> coming yeah. through. Yeah. yeah. It's so, it's so, it's so well done. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right, the crime. What crime? Okay. Yeah. This is a petty crime, and it is called Ghost Dog is My Weed Dealer. And this was sent from <gasps> our listener, Danielle. Okay. It says, I have a funny and touching story to share with you. A little more than a year ago, my friend's dog, Sparkles, passed away. She fell from a four-story window, survived, and then died 10 days later due to kidney failure. It was extremely tragic. Oh, oh honey. I know it starts out so sad. I was like, I'm sorry. She's like, I have a funny so story. Defined, it's so funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a different show. <laughs> Five teacups for canine tragedy. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It was extremely tragic and our whole neighborhood was affected because we all knew Sparkles. She was such a smart dog and it was not her time to go. Although it was such a sad event, it brought our community closer. A little backstory here. We live in Vancouver, British Columbia, and the crows here are next level. They steal, they swoop, they attack. If you Google Canuck the Crow, you'll see that in Vancouver, we have an official crow named Canuck, and he stole a knife from a crime scene and was flying around the city oh. with a bloody knife. I hope to never cross <laughs> paths with him. Canuck the Crow. Canuck the Crow. Wow. Anyway, for Sparkle's entire life, the crows loved her. Whenever she would go outside for walks, crows would follow Sparkles the entire time. Sparkles would play around with them and they never were aggressive with her. They loved her. So after Sparkles died, crows started to follow me everywhere. I didn't think anything of it, but my friend knew that Sparkles loved me and her spirit must have sent the crows to protect me or just to say hi. That is so cool. I want crows to follow me. Are you kidding? How sweet too that this dog was like, I'll send, I'll send a sign your way. And it gets even better because mm -hmm. wow. now... Now Sparkles is sending a gift, maybe an illicit, <laughs> illegal gift in uh, British Columbia. I don't know their laws. But on the <laughs> one year anniversary of her death, a bunch of us were going to light sparklers as a celebration of life. Earlier in the day, I was walking to the grocery store when I saw a crow across the street with a huge bag of weed in his beak. I yelled, crow with weed, and I speed walked towards it. The crow hopped a few feet away, but quickly turned back and placed the bag of weed directly at my feet. I knew that Sparkle's <gasps> ghost sent me the weed via crow because her owner, Sarah, loves weed. What a hilarious and fitting gift. <laughs> oh, I told you this dog was smart. That night, we lit up some sparklers and lit up a joint in the shape of a cross to commemorate her. Sadly, this was the only time that this happened to me. Best, Danielle. <laughs> Best. <laughs> and here's Canuck. I... Oh, oh my God. I'm like, this is not a crime. This is a gift. It's like a gift and a crime altogether. It's a little yeah. bit of everything. Because this crow had to have found the weed somewhere. So really, it stole weed from someone. Yeah. Someone's missing some weed. Right. Someone's right. missing some right. weed. Or it's, a, or it's a crime scene. Yeah, it's from a crime scene. <laughs> so just to confirm, because now we have some investigative questions. Mm -hmm. The weed of was course. in a baggie? The weed was in a baggie? It was in a bag, yes. It was It was gift wrapped. Okay, great, okay. Probably a dime bag. Well, I know, I'm just confirming because if it wasn't in a bag, then maybe the crow harvested it. <laughs> oh. In which case it wasn't theft. Yeah, so it was organic. But because it was in a plastic bag, we can confirm yeah. that the crow did not 
did not um, procure the weed. That's interesting, though, because if it weren't, I mean, we don't know for well, it did say it was in a bag. But I like this theory that perhaps a mystery even bigger than Bigfoot would be a weed farmed by crows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a, weed, a weed farm farmed by crows <laughs> i've been robbed by a crow so I, like crow raven like they like shiny no wonder it picked the knife up they stole our sunglasses on a hike and they distracted us as a duo two crows <laughs> they distracted us so the other one could swoop behind us and grab our sunglasses no joke same same friend chelsea i love crows yeah okay have you listened to ologies the podcast Mm -mm. it's Allie Ward she has an ologies. episode so basically she she interviews a bunch of different professionals in all types of ologies she has one episode about crows they are so smart they have funerals they have facial recognition for life so if they see you they'll recognize you for for life and Griff since this crow already successfully stole from you if you ever encounter if you and Chelsea ever encounter that duo again you're probably going to be a target they're going to know you're an easy Easy steal. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, little does it know that I also have lifelong facial recognition. So <laughs> I'm going to steer clear from that crow. I have we five so crows perplexed. that that live in my little like courtyard, and they have been here for like two years. Apparently, I just moved in here, so I'm I'm learning. I'm meeting the crows. We're we're just getting to know each other. But there's one with crooked feet that is so cute. Oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Karina, you're such a witch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, it's compliment. compliment. I'm also like really interested in the children's book. That's like Sabrina and the Crooked Footed Crow. Oh my God. Yeah. That's such a good one. That's a great name. We can all team up together Goodbye. and write it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. But we can all hope too that, that you have Sabrina and all of us have some spirit on the other side that's looking out for us. Like Sparkles looked out for Danielle with the weed deal. Absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of, do we find anyone in that story guilty? A few more questions okay. will be asked. Yeah. Um, I have questions about the cross-shaped joint. <laughs> yes, that is interesting. Um, are you guys able are you guys able to picture that in in your mind's eye? I yeah, am. there's a sparkler. I assume the sparkler is the the vertical part of the cross and the joint is the horizontal at the top to create the cross. A sparkler to commemorate sparkles and the joint as the as the gift the offering and is the sparkler the sparkler is lit at the same time as the joint oh interesting everyone's lit baby. i think i think <laughs> i think lighting the joint lights the sparkler one lights the other okay. right yeah either way i feel like somebody's eyelashes are gonna get singed but i kind of agree with you i my questions are mostly about our listener and the decision of this group of people to consume a bag of weed dropped off by a crow <laughs> without <laughs> further investigation that's a good one yeah. and then the decision to <laughs> to light it with a this sparkler. is the type of person who yeah. finds like a a cheeto in their pocket and they have no idea when it's from and they still eat it i think <laughs> or like my um my uncle well he's not really my uncle but like we i don't know we like call him my uncle and Your fake he, uncle yeah yeah, like, you know what I mean? One of those, like, yeah. he's like an old guy who's well, a family friend. And, those, yeah. You know what I mean? And like, he's been studying sex since the 70s, but like not in a professional capacity. Like one of those. Interesting. And, and Roger. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. And he, we don't so, all have one no. of those, but yeah. Come okay. on. Oh, come on. No, I don't know. It's universal. Okay. And he, well, he had a bald eagle dropped a salmon on his doorstep, like by accident. And he just brought it inside and he cooked it and he ate it. This is how the avian flu takes over his area. <laughs> See, that one I would be more I would be more inclined to do that than the weed because it's like, okay, clearly this bald eagle was just fishing for its own Fresh meal fish. Yes. and accidentally dropped it. Whereas the crow, who knows where this bag of weed came from? Right. Like why didn't the previous owner of the weed hold on to it tighter? <laughs> Fight for it harder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's an important tricks. question. Is These fucking like, birds are smart. I want to see how it got the bag because I think in my mind I was I was thinking it just found it outside on a on a patio table or whatever and took off with it. But Kira, you bring up an interesting point. Could there have been a battle that occurred for this crow to obtain this bag of weed? <laughs> Do you think there's a person out there who's telling a story of how their weed went missing and they think a ghost stole it and we could solve the mystery right now? I mean, the ghost of Sparkles yes. did by possessing this crow or at least bribing them somehow. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot this to unpack hap- here. This is what happens when our shows merge. It just crimes are solved and beauty is born. Mm. You blame the ghost. <laughs> I'm now imagining. I'm imagining the four of us going on like an uh, an investigative journalist approach. We all travel to Vancouver. We track down our listener. We're like, show us exactly where the crow dropped the weed. And then we put up signs. Did you lose weed back in whatever year it was? Exactly. Suspect photos of we the find, crow. Just an awful yeah. sketch drawing of a crow. And like every the single original owner. Like every single stony baloney in the Vancouver area is like, I lost weed. Like return the weed to me. It's like, okay, you can't all have lost weed. <laughs> And despite uh, any evidence, man. every single episode of the show, we just blame the ghost in the end. It doesn't matter, right, right, it doesn't right. matter yes. what we yeah. found. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so if we're doing our, our due diligence as like in our petty crimes format, we would normally yeah. we would normally have a formal deliberation and say who in this instance mm-hmm. is guilty of a petty crime. So Kira in, in court, Kira, Sabrina, Corin in court, do we find the crow guilty for taking whether it was stolen it did take it taking the bag of weed by direction of sparkles yes but i wouldn't want to convict them of i wouldn't want them to have to go through any um any punishment yeah, it was coercion right. it was sparkles it was, i think it's all on sparkles but i okay. also don't want yeah. sparkles I, sparkles did if anything sparkles did a good thing yeah i say not guilty all right do we find the people who were gifted the weed guilty for smoking it um in general because it was a stranger substance what do we what would say we in addition to this um guilty of the uh cross-shaped uh joint sparkler oh uh, yes mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. question is that is a question is are they guilty of that i don't find them guilty for the cross-shaped joint i love that and so long as they're protecting their eyelashes i think they're good i was gonna say they're guilty but i almost want to let them get away with it because they got away with it like yeah. i mm-hmm. i applaud them for well, I feel that. like they're that actually, the I think they're doing a good service. Again, I'm making everyone a, a good, a good saint here in this very religious episode, because what would they do other than smoke it? I feel like they got rid of it in the best way possible, because had they looked for someone else who potentially lost their weed or had it stolen, then they themselves become drug dealers. And if they were to just simply throw it away, perhaps they would have been responsible. What if a baby got it, right? Like, right. So right. There was only one oh way gosh. to properly dispose of this mm-hmm. item, and they Safely. did it exactly in that way. Mm-hmm. You're right. Mm-hmm. That's a good way to look at it. They're saving lives. They're saving babies by doing this. 100%. And I guess the final question in our verdict section of this mini crime is, is Sparkles guilty for jumping? <gasps> no. Criv! <laughs> <laughs> Why? No, sweet Sparkles. Did it fall out of a window or a ledge? I, th- I think it was a four-story window, which is kind of oh, traumatizing maybe. for me because I once witnessed a dog fall from a five-story window. The sound of the dog still plays in my head. I no. wrapped it in someone's pool towel that they handed me it died literally in my arms. I watched its eye go from like living to like poof, dead. And I wrapped it up, brought it into my car and drove it to an emergency vet. Cause I was like, I called ahead. I was like, this dog is dead. I know there's nothing you guys can do, but like, yeah. I-, I have to bring um, it to you. I have to do something. The owner was out of town and someone was dog sitting. It was horrible. Maybe it was this person. Maybe this was sparkles. Keep your windows closed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like we can't end on that. So I'm going to tell you an embarrassing story. <laughs> um, I would also say in in the case of this petty crime, I would say the only guilty party I find is the window. There the we go. Yeah, window the window is guilty. I agree. The window and the wind. You know, maybe there was a yeah. weird scent yeah. in the air that was luring poor sparkles outside. It makes me so sad. To end on a funnier story, <laughs> bring us back up. So weed. I, the very, (laughs) one of the very first times I consumed weed, I was with a friend and we had a bag of weed, but we didn't have a lighter. We didn't have anything to roll it in or like to pack it into a bowl. And we were like, let's eat it. So, oh my gosh. (laughs) 
Wow. So we went to a Wawa. Th- this is me and my friend Erica. We went to a Wawa and you know how they had those like little cups that you pulled the plastic off and you put it in and they like um made it like a smoothie? Mm-hmm. Yes. So we went into a the Wawa. And we grabbed, yeah, we grabbed those and we put the little nugget of weed into it and then blended it on the Wawa's blender <laughs> and ate crunchy, chunky pieces of weed smoothie. <laughs> and what was the effect of that? I don't, I, I'm pretty sure you have to heat it up to like activate the, <laughs> the so just nothing, seasoning, just okay. disgustingness. A seasoned yeah, smoothie. Yeah, it was basically some, some oregano on our smoothie. Yep. You're guilty for that. Yeah, <laughs> I think true, I am The guilty too. party in A all of this episode. Witch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was in my trial periods, you know, my, mm. my early mm. days of my adventures. <laughs> so good so, wow well thank you both for joining us and sharing your interest in the paranormal with us we're really excited to talk petty crimes more on your show yeah this was this was a fun world to step into i really I, I love all of the shit so yeah thank you for having Last us question. You, have, you have two new fans <laughs> thank you well great uh you have two new fans too <laughs> yeah. one okay question to end on i love aliens corinne loves bigfoot who would you rather date, Bigfoot or aliens? Um, I would choose aliens just because I'm looking for an out-of-this-world experience. Love. Beautiful. Snaps for that. <laughs> I would choose Bigfoot because I love the outdoors. He could take you on so many amazing dates. Yeah. Corinne likes to picture her, um, like the Twilight scene where Edward puts yep. Bella on her back <laughs> and like, she swings through the trees. I'm Bigfoot so Just picture monkey. that with Bigfoot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just so, <laughs> say it, say it, say it. No, 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 I, I, no, 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 no. Um, Bigfoot is tough though, like because I am, I like a bigger, brawnier guy. I'm in that kind of phase in my, I guess, queerness, and mm. so it was a tough choice. But I, I, I would much rather have sex in space. Come on. Mm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and we don't know. <laughs> Aliens could be really buff. We, we don't know. Or, oh, yeah, you know, sure. That's right. Bigfoot might be an alien too. So we might get the best of both worlds yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> True. I just worry that an alien's idea of sex might be a lot different than yours. Like what if the alien's idea of sex is like putting its entire mouth over your head and going like, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I don't know. Have you I ever tried it? Maybe, it? maybe it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> Just like tentacles come out just, and wet willy feel... you over and over and over again. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, choose, I choose Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, oh, we've man. learned a lot about you. And we loved yes. every bit of it. So <laughs> thank you for joining us. We do a sign off at the you. end of our episodes. Do you want to do it with us? Sure. Mm. And we will see, see you on the other other side. side.